I want to ask you a question this morning, and to answer this question, I need you to imagine for a moment that you are a single parent. I realize some of you don't have to imagine that. That's where you are. But for the rest of you, just imagine that you are a single mom, and you have raised two children, a girl and a boy, and, and uh, it's been a tough go, but your daughter, who's older, is doing really well. She... Uh, she put herself through nursing school. She got a good job as a nurse, and she is now married. And in fact, she and her husband, her husband is a nurse, uh, they, they have two kids. They have a boy and a girl, so you have a, a granddaughter and a grandson. And you're proud of your daughter and what she's put together. But you also have a son who's a few years younger, and, and he hasn't been doing so well. He's struggled since he was a, a teenager with drugs and alcohol running in groups of people that got him in trouble. In fact, he was in and out of trouble with the law enough times that by the time he was 20 years old, imagine he had already been in prison twice. But his second time in prison, he, he got clean, got sober, got his life together. And he came out of his second stint in prison a changed person. He started coming back to church with you and, and with your sister and with his sister and, and got a job. It wasn't a great job, but it was a steady job and he stayed clean and you were proud of your son. Imagine, imagine how you'd feel if he was making that kind of progress and, and, and he became trustworthy again and eventually he got to spend time with his niece and his nephew and, and helped out with his sister and, and their hectic schedule. Two nurses that kind of their schedules collided sometimes. And, and he would come over and, and watch the kids because every once in a while their shifts uh, overlapped and, and he helped out when he could. And he was reliable. But imagine how you would feel if you found out he started using again. Well, you didn't really find out. Nobody really knew, but he did. He had a susceptibility to heroin and one day, when he was at your home with your daughter and your son. You were out at work, your husband was finishing his shift and, and he was there doing you a favor watching them. He, he needed a fix real bad and he was, he was rifling through your bedroom. We were going through the drawers and the medicine cabinets, hoping to find a hypodermic needle that, that maybe you had carried home from work. And as he was going through those those things in your room rifling through your bedroom, your little eight-year-old daughter shows up and says, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be in here. I'm going to tell mommy. I'm going to tell her. Imagine that he flies into a rage and he begins to choke his niece. And, and at the point where she is almost completely out of breath, he, he, he grabs her and in violence and violently throws her so hard across the room that she hits her head on the door jamb of the bedroom and it kills her. Imagine that he goes into a panic and, and he, he tries to set the scene to make it look like someone had broke in and attacked him and her. And, and he breaks some windows and he goes into the garage. He finds a circular saw and cuts himself a number of times. And then he calls 911 and says, someone broke in. The police and the fire department, the paramedics come. and They rush him to the hospital. They find that the little girl has died. But it didn't take the detectives very long to figure out what had really happened. So they placed him in protective custody. And after a couple of days, the detectives approach the grandmother and the mother, the sister, and say, uh, this is what we believe happened and we're going to charge him with capital murder. And in Texas, capital murder, murder of a child carries the death penalty. And we are gonna press for the death penalty unless you encourage us to encourage him to plead out. And if he does, we will accept a life sentence. Question is, if you were 
that single mom, if you were the grandmother of that murdered girl and the mother of the murderer's son, what would you do? Would you uh, allow him to plead out rather than to suffer the consequences? I think most of us, most of us would, would say, yeah, of course. I mean, I don't want to participate in, in the execution of, of a family member. I, 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 can, I can see the, the, the rationale for saying, yeah, let him spend the rest of his life in prison. But that begs the deeper question. The deeper question isn't, what would you do in that circumstance? The deeper question is, what do you do when you are at the limit of forgiveness? What do you do when, when the line you need to cross to show grace is too far? What do, you, what do you do when the circumstances would require you to make a sacrifice for it to be inconvenient for you to show grace? What will we do? We are, here at Riverbend, a church of grace. And, it's an elegant, it's, a, it's, it's an appropriate label. I hope you appreciate that, that it's shorthand for a lot of things about who we hope to be as a community. When we say we are a church of grace that is a, that is a sophisticated, that is a complex, it is an elegant understanding of who we are called to be. We are people who are recipients of grace and we are people who seek to practice grace. But what does that mean? What does it mean to truly be a people of grace? What does that look like? I think we are familiar with a comfortable grace. We are familiar with a convenient grace, a, a grace that works to promise us forgiveness, a grace that works when the challenges are not great. But are we really a church of grace? if we are not a people who practice an inconvenient and uncomfortable grace. Where are the boundaries? Where are the lines? When is the line too far? When is, when, when is, when is the injury too great? When is forgiveness too heavy a weight to bear? When is grace a bridge too far? In the coming weeks, I want us to press into this and, and wrestle with idea, this idea. What does it mean to be a people of grace? And what are the limits? What are the tripwires? What are the boundaries? What are the lines that grace will not allow us to cross? What does it really mean to have an inconvenient grace? But before we press into that anymore today, would you... Pray with me. Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to comfort us and challenge us, to uh, cause us, inspire us, to press into the grace that we know and the grace that we show Pray that you would reveal that to us, what it means to be a people of an inconvenient grace. Pray that for myself and for my family, for all of us. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 750 years before the birth of Christ, the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. After the reign of Saul and David and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel, or the people of God, were split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was made up of 10 of the 12 tribes, and they were called Israel. The southern kingdom was the remaining two tribes, and they were known by the name of the larger tribe, Judah. 700 years or so before the birth of Christ, the two prominent prophets of God in the southern kingdom were a prophet named Isaiah and a prophet named Micah. In the northern kingdom, in the kingdom of Israel, the chief prophet about 750 years before the birth of Christ was a prophet named Hosea. 
And Hosea has one of the most interesting stories of all of the prophets in the entire Hebrew Bible. The story of Hosea begins with God commanding Hosea to marry a prostitute. God says in Hosea chapter 1, I want you to go and I want you to marry a prostitute. And he obeys God and he marries a prostitute named Gomer from the village of Diblaim. And the reason that God tells Hosea to marry this prostitute is because he will become, and their marriage will become, uh, an analogy, an illustration, a visual aid for the people of God about God's faithfulness and their unfaithfulness. They were involved in adultery and in spiritual prostitution. And so Hosea represents the gracious and loving God who still embraces the rebellious and adulterous nation of Israel. Now what's interesting is that, that Hosea and Gomer have three children and the three children represent the consequences of the nation's rebellion. Even though in fact, the grace of God is displayed in the marriage of Hosea and Gomer, their three children represent the consequences of going too far. Their first son is named Jezreel. Jezreel was a place of Israel's great disobedience. The name Yitzreel actually means what one sows, one also reaps. Their daughter, their second child, was a daughter named Lo Ruch Ma. And it literally means the unloved or those who are not loved. Their third child was a boy who was told to be named Lo-Ami. And Lo-Ami means not my people. And there in the midst of the illustration of grace is the contrast of the consequences of their disobedience. You see, grace is a complicated subject because there has to be consequences or grace doesn't matter. If there's not a line that can't, if there's no line to be crossed, then grace has no meaning. Grace and forgiveness only matters if there is a violation, if there is an offense. And so in light of the lines that the nation was crossed, what is the context of grace and where are those lines? 700 years after the prophet Hosea had passed off the scene, the prophet of all prophets came to Israel. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of all kings, the prophet of all prophets. And in his teaching, he was manifesting the love and the grace of God, but he was also revealing to us the tripwires and the boundaries and the lines that should not be crossed. You see him, if you study the life of Christ at all, you see those times when, when he calls out his own disciples, especially Peter, for the violations of the, of the love of God and the violations of the character of God. He calls out the people of Israel, some, some villages and, and groups of people. He identifies that they have separated themselves from God's love. But most often he has collisions with the religious experts, the people who are steeped in their faith, the, the religious professionals. We know them as the Pharisees. And he is often colliding with them because he is describing them as people who have abandoned the love and the grace of God and have violated that covenant. In the 12th chapter of the story that Matthew records in Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, Jesus, Jesus is at his limit. He is having a collision with these religious leaders. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, at the very first verse, it tells us that it was a Saturday. It was the Sabbath day. It was a day of rest. And Matthew tells us that Jesus and his disciples were walking through a grain field. And as they were walking through the grain field, they were just casually probably pulling off of the stalks some of the heads of grain and rubbing them and then eating them as they went, kind of like homemade granola bars on the run. You ever do that? You ever work in a field? 
and you, and you eat what you're, like if you're picking apples or strawberries or if you're in a field. Well, I grew up on a farm when we would pick peas. You ever eat raw peas right out of the dirt? They're delicious. Carrots, I would eat carrots right out of the ground. Just kind of rub them off and eat them. My favorite thing to eat were potatoes. I would just take a potato out of the ground and you know, do that. I would take a bite right out of a raw potato. I mean, the dirt adds a little bit of texture to it, but you know, I mean, you're out there for a couple of hours or you got nothing going on. You gotta eat. It would be good if you had a little salt, actually, but <laughs> you ever, I know what you're thinking right now. Dave, that's disgusting. Well, the Pharisees thought that what Jesus was doing with his disciples was disgusting because he was violating the law. You see, they called him out on it. They said, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of rest. And picking with your hand some grain and eating it as a snack was considered harvesting, which was considered work. And they weren't wrong. The Sabbath was to be a day of rest. The fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, talks about how it was supposed to be a special day but they had layered it over with trip wires and boundaries and, and, and rules so that you, you almost couldn't possibly get through a Saturday without somehow violating the Sabbath. And they called out Jesus on it. Jesus' response is an explanation of, of where the boundaries of grace are. He responds to the Pharisees, uh, the Pharisees' accusation by asking three questions. And the first two questions he asks the same way. It's a phrase, he says, haven't you read? Grammatically, the way it's structured is it's, it's phrased as if it expects a positive answer. It's like, I know you know this. I know you have read this. You've read this, haven't you, is kind of how it sounds. And the first question he asks is, haven't you read the story of David and David's men when what they did when they were hungry? It's a story from 1 Samuel chapter 21. David was running from the psychopath Saul and he and his men came to a village called Nob. And this is where the tabernacle had been set up. And David goes into the tabernacle on the Sabbath day and he asks the high priest, whose name was Ahimelech, do you have anything for us to eat? And Elimelech says, no, it's the Sabbath. The only thing we have are the loaves that were baked for the offering on the Sabbath, the showbread, the bread of the presence of God. And David says, I'll take it. And the story in 1 Samuel tells us that David, without guilt, took the, took the bread on the Sabbath. It was dedicated to the Lord. And then Jesus asked him a second question. Haven't you read what the law allows for you as priests. Because the law allows for you as priests to work on the Sabbath. You have to work on the Sabbath. And, and it's absolutely true. There were dozens of commands and dozens of instructions. For example, in the book of Leviticus, there are instructions to, for the priests to make particular bread. It's a Sabbath bread. A bread that was only used on the Saturday on the Sabbath offering. And they had to make 12 loaves of it. And in the Mishnah and the writings of the rabbis down through the centuries, there were explicit instructions on how the bread was to be made, how it was to be processed. There was a liturgical process. It was work. In the book of Exodus, it commands the priests to create a special sacrifice, a special Sabbath lamb. They were to sacrifice a young male lamb without blemish on Saturday as a special Sabbath offering. And there were pages and pages of regulations for how the priests were to go about preparing the lamb and then carving the lamb and the knives they were to use. There were instructions on the clothes they were to wear. And Jesus is pointing out, do you, you realize that you actually work on the Sabbath? These are the exceptions that prove the rule. They're the exceptions that demonstrate the power of grace. You say you know that, but do you really know that? See, we know grace. We know the idea of grace, but do we really understand it? 
when I was in my early 20s, I, I felt a call to the ministry. And my first job was as a youth pastor at a small church in New Jersey. And it, I was a dangerous person, I got to tell you that. I mean, when you're 21 years old and you are leading 17 and 18-year-olds, there's, there's, there's not a lot of wisdom in that group. And so we had a great time, and, 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 that, and that group grew and grew and grew. And, and, and I started, after a while, to get a group of, the, of, <coughs> of these young teenage boys together every Sunday to play flag football on a field that was next door to the church. And so after a couple of weeks, and the group grew to about 20 or 30 guys, I said to them one time, I said, if you guys come to Sunday night church with me, because we had church on Sunday night, I'll buy you pizza afterwards. And they were like, okay. So they all go to church with me, and we all sit in the back. And, and I like to think that we were pretty well behaved. And so we get out of the church, and, and I'm leaving the church, and one of the deacons comes up to me and says, we need to talk. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to tell me how awesome I am, how great it is? Let me bring in all these guys. No, I, th I think the deacon board will want to meet with you. We'll give you a call. So the following Saturday, I got together with the deacons of the church, and they didn't inform me how awesome I was. They informed me how bad it was for me to bring those men, those young boys, into the church on a Sunday night for a worship service in shorts and T-shirts. How dare I do such a thing? And, oh, by the way, we don't like you playing flag football on the field next to the church on Sundays. You ever met anybody like that? Are you familiar with how churches operate like that? Churches that say they know what grace is? I think we all do it. We make grace a comfortable and a convenient application of our of our redemption. Grace is good for us, but we don't really understand it. We don't understand that grace was never meant to be comfortable or convenient. And this is what Jesus says. The third question that he asks them there in Matthew chapter 12, he uses a different word. He doesn't say, Do you have, haven't you read? He says, don't you understand and he uses the Greek word understanding, the epigenosko, it kind of means to understand by experience, to have a full knowledge of something. Do you, have, do you really understand what the prophet meant when he said, I desire mercy more than sacrifice? And he's quoting from the prophet Hosea. He's quoting from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Where Hosea says, I want to show mercy, not sacrifices. And the word there for love, the word for mercy, is the Hebrew word chesed. In the Hebrew language, the closest word to the word for grace that they have is the word chesed. Because it means unconditional, unmerited favor. It is as close to the concept of unconditional love as any word in the Hebrew language. And God said, this is my priority. This is what grace is. The snapshot of grace was in the life of Hosea. When Hosea married Gomer and they had three children together, it was meant to illustrate the grace of God. Look at, his, at God's faithfulness in the face of your unfaithfulness. In fact, the first three chapters of, of the book of Hosea tell of Hosea and Gomer's relationship. And after they had three children, she left him and went back to a life of prostitution. And God tells Hosea in Hosea chapter 3, go buy her back again. But the story of grace doesn't end with Hosea going and, 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 and bringing Gomer back. It ends about 20 years later, in 722 BC, when the Assyrian army marched into northern Israel under the leadership of Shalmaneser V, and they wiped out the nation of Israel. You've heard of the 10 lost tribes of Israel? That's when it happened. And even though they were staring in the face of the, of the promise of grace, grace, 
there were consequences for their disobedience. See, this is where it gets sticky for us. Where are the lines? When, when do the consequences come into play? When is it too far? When, is, when, when have you committed the unpardonable sin? That's a tough question to answer. In fact, I'm not sure that we can. That's why Jesus says there in Matthew chapter 12, he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the decider of where the lines are. And when we try to figure out where an infinite God has a finite capacity, we run up against a, a thing that we cannot comprehend. And I think what God is saying to us is, I've got this. I've, I, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the God of grace. Let me decide when it's too far. Let me decide when the consequences need to be weighed out. And you know how much trouble we get in when we make it our decision. But how do we do it? How do we know? Because, because the question really isn't possible. For us to answer what are the limits of God's grace I think the most important question to ask is what are the limits of ours what are the trip wires what are the boundaries when can our grace go no further because we all have it we have those things that irritate us those those things we disagree with those 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 behaviors that feel like a violation of our standards or our preferences or our codes. It's there. It's there at the limit of our grace, at the comfort of our grace, that we begin to find what grace really is. It's when it's tested, when it's pushed. Grace at the limit. Now, what I'm going to tell you, you're probably going to be shocked. You're going to... You, you may not even believe me when I tell you this. But I was a horrible child. I was a nightmare. I mean, I know. You look at me now and you say, well, the paragon of righteousness, the, 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 the icon of, of true holiness. And, and you look and you say, Dave, no, that can't be true. You were, a, you were a problem child. You have no idea. I was a parent's nightmare. I cannot tell you how many times my father took his belt off to beat some sense into me. Countless times I was sent to my room. I went to dinner. I, I, was, I was sent to my, my room without dinner more times than I can remember because I was constantly trying to find out where the tripwire was, where the boundary was. And I was pushing in every direction over and over and over again. But you know what I found out? That I had parents who loved me. And while I may have violated their sense of tolerance and their ability to put up with my stupidity and been punished for it, I never, ever crossed a line that caused them to give up or to lose their love. See, the question we have to wrestle with is not a, what is the boundary of God's love. God's got that figured out. The question we have to ask ourselves is what is the boundary of ours? What are the limits of grace that we can show? And then when we get to that limit, ask ourselves, what does grace require? Or as Pastor Kevin Hedges taught me a number of years ago, it's the question, what does love require? require when you feel violated when you feel offended when you feel that the disagreement you have with another person is is insurmountable it is a bridge too far what does love require what are the limits of grace and are you willing not just to practice a comfortable convenient grace but an uncomfortable inconvenient grace That story that I asked you to imagine sort of clumsily that, that you were a single mom with two children and you were victimized by a horrific crime, that's, that's not a fictional story. It's a true story. It actually happened. 
It was March the 5th, 1994. It was a Saturday, coincidentally, when I got the call that told me that the series of events that took the life of a young eight-year-old girl had happened to a family from our church. I remember being in the hospital and meeting with the mom and her daughter and, and having the initial conversations about the loss of their daughter. And at that time, they believed that their their brother and son had been attacked. But I was also with them when the police and the district attorney came and said, no, the evidence suggests that he staged the whole thing and we are gonna charge him with capital murder. And we're gonna offer you a chance to allow us to see if he will plead out. And he did. They allowed the, the plea to take place and he was sentenced to life in prison. That was 28 years ago. He is currently incarcerated at the Cofield Unit in North Texas and he has been in prison for 28 years and he went there when he was 24 years old. And if he ever achieves parole, it won't be until he is well into his 70s. But I know what grace looks like in the face of that. Grace may have spared his life, but grace did not free him from the consequences of his choice. But I can tell you what grace looks like because I watched his mother visit him in prison every week until the day she died. See, the question that I think we need to answer is not the question of what is the limit of God's grace. The question is, what is the limit of our grace? And not what would you do in a horrible situation that I described, but what do you do every day? When someone offends you or bothers you or irritates you or disagrees with you, when, when someone is, is across the political fence or aisle from you or, or in a, behaves in a way and practices their life in a way that, that you're uncomfortable with, Ask yourself what the limits of grace should be. And ask it with one simple question. This is the question I'm going to leave with you. What does love require of you?